All right. Again, thank everybody. Thank you to everyone uh, who has signed up, uh, who's watching us here on the Zoom, who's watching us on Facebook Live, and who will eventually watch this video um, after it's recorded and put out on our YouTube channel and our resource page on uh, our website. Uh, my name is Caleb Talley. I'm the Director of Marketing and Events for the uh, Startup Junkie uh, team. For those of you who are not familiar with Startup Junkie, uh, we are a mission-driven organization based here in Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, with the goal of empowering innovators and entrepreneurs, and we do that uh, in a couple of different ways, and uh, one of those ways is through one-on-one -on -one consulting at absolutely no cost to entrepreneurs from idea stage up to $25 million in revenue. Um, you could have an idea written on the back of, the nap of a napkin and you just want to come in and bounce it off of somebody um, all the way up to um, you know, full-blown consulting. That's what we're here for. Uh, the other facet um, of how we empower innovators and entrepreneurs is through events. Uh, you know, this time last year, it would have been through networking events and lunch and learns and in-person meetups and uh, workshops. And but nowadays, we're obviously doing this all through um, a virtual component um, like Zoom. So uh, we thank you for being here. Thank you for participating uh, on your lunch hour. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, have partnered with uh, Dusty Pruitt for this webinar. Uh, Dusty is the founder of Headwaters Consulting Group, a management consulting firm based in Fayetteville that specializes in helping organizations in the middle and lower middle market uh, drive strategy and execution. Dusty is a certified EOS implementer, uh, which we know is entrepreneurial operating system and serves as an executive coach to senior leaders. Before devoting his work full-time to Headwaters, Dusty served in the multiple of in multiple executive roles, helping lead organization turnarounds. Uh, through the process, he discovered a passion for helping build and run high quality of effective organizations. Stessy, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Caleb, thanks. Hey, it's good to see everybody. I'm glad to be here. I would, just as you were reading that, I was reflecting on uh, every, I think I've been a part of an organization at every level of what you described uh, and worked with Startup Junkie from ideas on the back of the envelope at, at Loaf and Joe's in Fayetteville, <laughs> all the way up to the $20 million business. And, you know, Brett, Caleb, and the team have been a huge resource for me in all of those organizations. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today and get to share this with you. Um, I, you know, an hour goes fast, so I'll try to uh, get, get things moving right away. But just before I, I jump into it, I, I did want to um, just highlight maybe the, the topic that we're covering today. Uh, and the title of it is how to simplify, clarify, and achieve the intended results of your organization or the vision of, of your organization. And those three words are really important uh, as we go through, through today. The first one is to simplify. And if you're going to take notes, this would be like the one thing I would tell you to write down. And it's this, that complexity is the root of all evil in your organization. Like complexity, it just happens, it just grows, and it grows hair and arms and legs. And before you know it, you don't even have to try, it just gets more complex. And so our job as leaders, our job as, as business people and leading organizations is to drive with like intense obsession, drive simplicity into the organization. Complexity comes on its own, but we have to like reach this cathartic state of simplicity. And it's an eternal pursuit, it will never be over but always, 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 how do we make it more simple? So that's the first one is we've got to be really simple. The second one is clarify. And the, the, the reality is this, and, and I work with a, a number of organizations, no one ever has a problem having the vision. The problem is always that there's 10 different versions of the vision. And I cannot explain it, but there is a point where like the stars align when you've got everyone in the organization looking at and seeing the same vision. And, and that's such an important thing because we, we lose time, we lose energy, like the time and effort evaporate if we're not clear on what we're trying to accomplish. That's your job as a leader, that's the job of the leadership team of an organization. And then the last one is probably the most important uh, for our conversation today, which is how do you achieve those results? <clears throat> and it's just all about execution. Again, most people I work with, their, their issue is not that they have a bad, a, an idea that's not good. Most of us wouldn't have started a business if we didn't think it was a good idea. Uh, it's not that there's no passion for it. We're all very passionate people. Uh, we wouldn't be doing this if we weren't. 
the issue is often we don't have the tools to drive the discipline and execution down into the organization to achieve our intended result. And that's what I want to talk about today is this framework for high performance and execution that we can institutionalize and teach down through the organization. That's where the magic happens. That's where the, the rubber, proverbial rubber meets the road. And that's what this is about. I'll say this before I get started too. This is not anything I created. I am not an original thinker. <laughs> I like to find really good ideas and then just be excellent at those great ideas. So uh, all of what I'm talking about today uh, comes from a book called Traction. Uh, and you know, if you let Caleb know, I'd be happy to send a, a copy to, to those of you on the call. Uh, he, I'm sure he can get your email and I, I'll send it out. But this book changed how I think about running organizations uh, because it's so simple and importantly, it's something that we can teach. And so I became a disciple of the process. That's what I'm gonna share with you today. And then at the end of this, so that's, that's uh, we've talked a little bit about me right there, that's number one. I'm getting ready to talk about the tools or, or the, the traction tools. And then number three is how to apply this. And then uh, I'll, I'll leave time for questions at the end, but um, feel free to, for those of you who are live, uh, reach out and, and I will uh, be happy to send you a copy. Uh, it's that important to me. Okay, so that's a little bit about me. Last thing in terms of preamble, and then I'm gonna jump into it. I've run four organizations using these principles. I invest in a number of businesses uh, throughout, mostly in Northwest Arkansas, some throughout the Southeast. Every one of those businesses gets put through this process and it's the way that I can stay on top of it. And every Friday morning, I'm gonna to talk to you about an L10 meeting here in just a minute, but every Friday morning, that's what I do is sit in L10 meetings and watch to see how these businesses are, are evolving. So I'm not just a teacher uh, on this. I, I believe in it so much that all of my businesses go, go through this as well. Okay, so uh, everything I'm gonna talk about today is fits in this circle behind me. In just a minute, I'm gonna stand up and, and draw, but I'm gonna, let me move my monitor up here. Um, here's the reality. This is the reality of running an organization is that any given time, at any time, you've got approximately 120 to 130 things that you're dealing with. Just this stuff up in the nebulous. Uh, if you remember the movie Mighty Ducks, does anyone remember that movie? Probably you do. D1, it's the best. Well, there's this scene where Goldberg, the goalie, who, who's like, great guy, but he's scared of hockey putts, which is a really bad thing for uh, goalies to do. And so the way that they fix that problem, because uh, he's scared of hockey putts, is they strap him to the goal, right? And that, like they belt him to the goal. And then uh, the, the scene pans out and the coach says, Goldberg, are you ready? Today is the day you become a man. Like this is your bar mitzvah. And it pans out and the whole team is standing in front of the goal with hockey pucks. And the coach says, district five, ready, aim, fire. And they all start shooting hockey pucks at him. And he's standing there screaming. He's bolted to this like cold, hard iron thing. And hockey pucks are flying out of it a million miles an hour. And if that isn't a picture of what it's like to run a business, especially a small entrepreneurial business, I don't know what it is. Because these things are they're, they're hard, they're cold, they're fast, they're hurting. And I'm strapped to this iron thing that I can't go anywhere. Like I can't even go home for the weekend. I got to take this with me. That's what it feels like to run a business. And unfortunately, uh, it ju you just get tired. And initially it works because you've got this new job energy. But at some point, it gets really old. And I've been in that place. And I was like, there's got to be a better way. Uh, and so I went on this relentless pursuit to find a better way. And that's what I came up with here. And the thing is, all of those hockey putts, those are all really just issues in the organization. They're just things that you got to deal with. And to the extent that you can get good at dealing with those issues, all those things just fall into place because they're all really just symptoms of root causes. And so our job as leaders is to just identify the root cause that's causing the symptom and go to work on that. So what I'm going to introduce to you today are the six root causes, the six components of your business that you have to be great at and you have to relentlessly pursue getting better at so that all of that stuff, the hockey pucks, just start to fall into place. So I'm gonna do that and then as we go, uh, I've got uh, a number of illustrations. By the way, I figured everyone was burnt out on PowerPoints, I know I am, so hopefully you'll indulge me with a whiteboard instead of, of PowerPoints. Uh, right at the heart of everything we're going to talk about is your business. This is what you wake up and do every day. So it's centered. The hub of this wheel is around your business. And the first of those components is the vision component. And I'm going to say this, and I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. 
don't overthink vision. Vision is two things, where you're going and how you plan to get there. Don't overcomplicate it. It's one of those two things, where you're going, how you plan to get there. We have to have a vision. We have to have a line of sight to where we're going and how we plan to get there, if we expect at all our people to get on board and go with us. Uh, many of you would be familiar with the ancient King Solomon. He has this great proverb where he said, where there is no vision, the people perish, right? So that's the second component. You can't achieve a great vision if you don't have great people. We have to cut through all the stuff out there that describes what, you know, A players or top 10 talent or top core talent. We should cut through all of that and just figure out what it looks like to be a great person in our unique organization. Uh, next, one of the ways we know if we've got great people in the organization is with data, using data, objective facts and figures, cold, hard facts and figures to tell us objectively, yes or no, are we moving forward? And here's what I want you to see. When we're really clear as leaders on where we're going and how we plan to get there, when we've got an organization full of people who want to help us achieve that vision and we're using real numbers, to tell us yes or no, are we moving that way? When we're working, when we're good at those things, we can look down into the business. It's transparent and like lucid, and we can see all the blemishes, all the challenges, all the barriers, obstacles, opportunities. They just start to jump off the page at us. And we just call those issues. Issues are not bad things. I want to say that again. Issues are not bad things. They're just things. Uh, you know, every organization has issues. And importantly, what I want you to hear is that your greatness is not defined by how few issues you have. Greatness is defined by how well you can call those issues out, you can line them up, knock them down and make them go away. Great companies can deal with issues fast and forever. Bad companies often don't even call out the issues that they have. One of the things I tell a lot of my clients that I work with is if there are no issues, that's an issue. Issues are good, we need issues, that's what we need to go work on. And we've got to be good at solving that. Uh, the sixth component is process. Making sure that we're clear on the right and the best way to do the main stuff that our organization does. So many people st are starving for process because we do it one way and then something happens and then we do the same thing another way and then something happens. And at some point, we just have this cluster of processes and none of them are designed for efficiency or effectiveness. We're just sort of making it up as we go. And I'm telling you this, it is always easier to edit something than it is create something. And so let's create a process and then we can make tweaks. But when we're always creating a new way to do the same thing, our time has evaporated, our effectiveness goes down the drain. And, and maybe most importantly, our customers are not getting the same excellent service that we would want them to. And then the last one here, you can see it's closing in on it, it's traction. And there's no surprise here that traction is on the bottom and vision is on the top because vision without traction is hallucination. Thomas Edison said that. We've got to bring it down to the ground. Uh, one of the things I do for fitness uh, is uh, I, I get on a I, I cycle and I have a bike trainer out of my garage. I don't do it right now because it's nice outside, but in the winter, I see someone has, Alan's got his bike fayetteville shirt on. So I, I yeah, I like it. So, uh, so he knows what I'm talking about here, but in the winter when it's cold and rainy and dark, I go out to my garage at five in the morning and I get on my bike trainer and I just start pedaling. And for an hour, I'm on that stupid thing and I hate it, but it's, it's fitness. But I have, like, I'm sweaty, I'm tired. And an hour later, I get off and guess where I still am? In my garage. That's literally the definition, literally definition of spinning my wheels going nowhere. So traction is how do we take our bikes off the trainer Tires firmly on the ground, we're gonna get back on. Same energy, same effort, same wattage through the pedals, but in this time, we're gonna go somewhere. And where are we gonna go? We're gonna go up to our vision. That's what it looks like, really getting the tires to grip the pavement. So, like I said, those are the six things I have tried. I've tried to find number seven. I've tried to cut out, you know, one of the six to make, there's just six. That's, that's why there's six up here, because there's just six and I haven't found any more. I haven't been able to condense it down any less. Uh, but now what I want to do is go through each of those components again, make another pass around the wheel, if you will, and talk about what it looks like to get strong in each of those components. Remember, all the hockey pucks out there, 
fit into one or some combination of these six things. We just have to get really good and continue to get strong in each of those components. That's what I wanted to describe for you now. So let's start again with vision. And if we were in person, I would say, what is vision again? And you would say where you're going and how you plan to get there. And there's two parts to that. The first one is what we call the eight questions. And I'll jump in right here. If you're not on speaker view on Zoom, feel free to click that so the whiteboard gets a lot bigger on your screen because uh, some of my writing might get small. All right, it's the eight questions of vision. And so that's, uh, th there's, uh, I've got those listed up here. And I just want to walk through what those are really quick. But you as leaders, if you're part of an organization and leading that organization, or if you're working in an organization, these are the things that you should expect from the leadership team. Every organization has to be able to answer these questions. If we can't, we've got an issue that we're going to have to talk about. So the first of those is, what are your core values? Everyone's familiar with that term, I'm sure. But values are just the things inside of us. It's that kind of eternal, timeless principles that are inside of us in our organization and living those things out. You know, culture, this is a Simon Sinek thing, but he said culture is values plus behavior. It's those values lived out. That's why they're so important. Values are how we know who the right people are in our organization. And we've got to be good at those. And don't let those be cheesy. Don't let them be fake. They have to be real. Have you ever like opened the, the fridge and the milk has gone bad? You know, you can like smell it with your eyes. Like you, you ever, I think if you know what I'm talking about, that's when you open the door to your, your, your company, that's, it should hit you in the face. They should be profound. You should reek of those things. We've got to be good at core values and know what they are and coach people religiously that's what we expect to be in our organization. The next one then is core focus. That's just that idea of what, what do we love to do and we're best at. Uh, many of us maybe it's like have lapsed this, but there was a classic out there, a book called Good to Great. Probably we're all familiar with it. Uh, they talk about like Circuit City and you know, it's, it's old. I mean, it's 20, 20 plus years old. But uh, in that chapter five, if you get the audio book or, or read it, it's called the Hedgehog Concept. But it's just that thing that, we can do better than anybody else. That's what this is. Don't try to be all things to all people. Be great at one thing. Be profoundly great and excellent at one thing. So it's the combination of why the organization exists and then what the organization does. Why is that passion, that thing, it's the eternal pursuit you'll never be done doing. And then the what of the organization is just whatever it is that you do. You remember the movie Office Space, I'm sure. Uh, where he's sitting down and he's sitting in front of the bobs and the bobs say, so uh, what would you say you do here? Like if you remember that scene, this is the answer to that question. Whatever it is that you can do better than anyone else, I will put my team toe to toe against anyone in the world. We're better than them at this. Whatever that is, that's what you do better than anyone else. And it's the combination of those two things that you got to obsess about because as entrepreneurs, and all of us are guilty of this, there's an opportunity out there to sell cars, right? Oh yeah, we could, let's go sell some cars. But if it doesn't fit in that core focus, don't do it. It's a distraction. You're gonna take your best people with you in that direction. You're gonna sub-optimize whatever you do. Stay focused, focus on the focus. Next is the 10 year target. It's just that long range goal, that one number, that one thing we're marching towards. It doesn't have to be 10 years, it could be five. Uh, I have a, a bank that I work with that they think they can see 25 years into the future. And they're saying, this is that number 25 years from now that we're marching to. But it's, it's about direction. We're going that way because that way is very different than that way, that way, or that way. Setting direction. Uh, that's where we're going. Number four then is how are we going to get there? And that's with your customers. That's all about marketing strategy. Simply put, there's two parts to it. Who should we be talking to? And when we're talking to them, what should we be saying? Two things. So who should we be talking to? The ideal clients. Again, if we're trying to market to everybody, we're marketing to nobody. So crystal clear on that ideal avatar profile of that client. And then every message that our organization puts out has to be impactful and valuable to that group of people. Side note, it needs to be true as well. We can't lie. But so often we want to tell our customers what we want them to hear. Marketing is telling them what they want to hear so that they're interested in doing business with us. So 
recapping real quick, core values, who we are at the core, core focus, what we love to do and are best at, 10-year target, where we're going, marketing strategy, that's how we're going to get there. And then we really get into the meat of this. So we get into the three-year picture. So if we know what it looks like in 10 years, five, 10, seven years from now, okay, what does it look like at the end of three short years from now? And we got to start painting with color. We got to understand what revenue, what profit looks like. We got to understand uh, what the organization looks like. How many offices are you in? How many employees do you have? What initiatives have you pursued? New products, new services, and building and getting a lot of clarity around what it looks like three short years. By the way, it's 2020, almost is over, 21, 22, end of 2023. What does your organization need to look like? You as leaders, if you're leading the organization, you need to know the answer to that. It doesn't have to be crystal clear, but it does need to be clear so that you can get your organization moving in that direction. All right, if that's what it looks like in three years, what's it look like at the end of 21? So we're just double clicking, you can see on all of this and just getting it down to granularity. Again, getting tires on the pavement here. Same question, what do we gotta go get done this year? And if we get that done, does it set us up to have achieve our three-year picture? Yes, okay, if we've done that three-year picture, can we get to our 10-year? Yes, you can see how it's, it all is coming down. Uh, fortunately, a year isn't just one year, it's made up of, rock, of quarters, and so we call those quarterly rocks, but for us to be successful in the calendar year, what do we got to do this quarter? And then the last question of the eight questions is, okay, what's in our way? That's the issues list. Like I said, vision, where you're going, how you plan to get there, answer those eight questions. And then when you've answered those questions, the last piece of this is SBA, not Small Business Administration, it's a different SBA. SBA is shared by all. When you as the leader are clear on what this looks like for your organization, you then have to go like tell your people, this is where we're going as an organization. And there is a point, and it's not right away, but there is a point where the stars align and it just, it's, a, it's magic and it's cathartic and it's a, you wanna chase that feeling, it's unbelievable, but you've got then an organization full of people bought in to your vision, where you're going, how you plan to get there. All right, that's the first component. Second then is people. And there's two parts to this. The first one we call right people. And the second is right seats. So I've already talked about how we know what right, who right people are. And I, we talked about those are the people that share our core values, the people that live out our core values every day. So that's how we define right people. The next question is right seats. How do we know who those people, what seats they should be sitting in? to do a great job. And so we just go straight to something we call the accountability chart. Initially, it starts to look like an org chart. Every organization has some version of sales and marketing. Uh, every organization has some version of operations. And obviously there's a finance component. So it's people uh, bringing in work, people doing work, and people making sure we're getting paid for the work. It's really no more complicated than that. There needs to be somebody that ties it all together, that harmoniously integrates all of the functions of the organization. We, we in, in the EOS world call that the integrator. And then, you know, half the time, that's what the organization looks like. The other half the time, there's a, a fifth role, something that we call the visionary. And you all know these people, when you see a visionary, they love to live at 30,000 feet. They love to read the tea leaves and like have the big ideas. They love the big relationships, love to go to the industry events. They often keep the culture and the vibe of the organization alive. But if you let those people run the company, man, it feels like this. It's zigzag back and forth. This is where you start selling cars sometimes when you shouldn't be selling cars. Uh, we need visionaries in our organization, but we need to make sure that we've got someone in place, in this case, the integrator, to make sure we're staying focused. I, one of the companies I worked with, I was the integrator and we had a visionary and one of his jobs was to come with 10 ideas for our business every single week. He came to me every single week with 10 things that we should do. I had the veto power <laughs> to say those are because you know what, nine of them were stupid and crazy, but there was the one, there was the one that we could plug into this thing and make some money on. So, we, and, and I mean, it was unbelievable how well it worked, uh, but you, visionaries often when they run the organization, we see zigzags. And so the integrator makes sure we're moving straight. So right now it looks like an org chart. The reason we call it the accountability chart is what we have to do is then go get clear 
on the major things that each of these seats in the organization are accountable to deliver. What do we expect them to deliver to the organization? And I'm telling you, when you get clarity on that, like your employees are thirsty to know what is it that I do here? What is it that I'm accountable to deliver to this organization? And we as leaders need to be able to give that to them. So the way this works is not just, just picture one of these boxes here. The first thing we need to do is name the box. So but by the way, when I talk about application up here, number three, this is one of the things that I would recommend. Look at your org chart and then go double click on it and make it an accountability chart. So the first thing is, what are you gonna call the seat? Let's say in this, this case, we're gonna call it sales. So this is a sales seat, maybe it's business development, maybe it's account management, whatever you call that, but it's a sales seat. And then here, importantly, what is this seat accountable to deliver to the organization? Probably the first one is revenue. Like if revenue doesn't happen, it's not finance's fault, it's sales fault, but we're clear on where accountability lies. You can, if two, I always say this, if two people are accountable, nobody's accountable. Like when I tell my kids to feed my dog, kids go feed the dog, guess what happens to my dog? He's going to die because nobody's going to, because he's not there. Nobody's accountable when two people are accountable. So when we look at this structure, if we've got a revenue issue, we're crystal clear on where this, this goes. If we've got a profitability issue, maybe that's here. If we're not meeting demand on time, if data is inaccurate, wherever you put all that stuff, give crystal clarity to what that person is accountable to deliver. So step one is name the role. Step two is then determine what that seat is accountable to deliver to the organization. And then and only then, this is like a really, I'm going to make it even thicker. Don't violate this. Don't violate this. Then and only then put someone in the seat if they get one and have the capacity to do that seat well. So we're saying this seat is sales. They're accountable for revenue. They're accountable for writing and pricing contracts. They're accountable for uh, the CRM management, they're accountable for the sales process and whatever else. Okay, that's what the organization needs from this role. All right, let's put Amy in the seat if she gets it once it has the capacity to do it well. Don't put people, don't build seats around people where the second that person leaves uh, the organization, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. It's not, you're not screwed, but it makes it a lot cleaner. So always boxes first, then the bullet points and then put the person in the seat. Again, if they get it, want to have the capacity to do it. That's what right seats. And then if Amy shares our core values and she can do this job really, really well, she's a right person sitting in the right seat. That's what it looks like to be strong in the people component. All right, let's go over to the data piece. Again, removing the subjective gut feel of the business and just looking at cold, hard facts. How can we objectively know yes or no, this business is moving forward? First is a scorecard. This has been called any number of things over the years. Uh, you probably all have some version of a scorecard, KPIs, dashboard reports, whatever it is. What I, we, I call it a scorecard or we call it a scorecard because it just shows us who's winning. It shows us if we're ahead or not. I want to make a, an important distinction here. Scorecards are very different than reports. I'm going to put reports over here. Reports should tell us what happened. Scorecards should tell us what is happening, if that makes sense. So, uh, so often many of us are running our business on a monthly or quarterly report. We're looking into the past to project the future, which is fine. We need reports, but reports should be telling us whether or not we achieved our objectives. Scorecards should tell us if we're actually doing the work to achieve those objectives. If I'm trying to lose weight, I don't want to know weight. Weight is a report, right? If I'm trying to, if I'm, if I'm 205 pounds and I'm trying to get down to, to 195, which means it's, I've got to go a lot of cycling uh, in my garage to do that. But if I'm trying, if I'm trying to lose those 10 pounds, the report tells me what my weight is. But what I'm more interested in, double clicking on that, maybe I want to measure calories in and calories out, right? Because weight should be a component of those two things. So if I'm measuring calories in and calories out every single week chances are I know what my, I don't maybe not know how fast I'm gonna get there, but I know what I'm gonna see on my report. So that's again, not reports tell us what happened, scorecards tell us what's happening, and that's an important distinction. And the way this works is we just have to determine 
the measurables, the things we need to know about our business. If I'm running a sales team, one of the things I want to know is how many leads did I get last week? That's an important thing because I know based on a conversion rate, if I get 10 leads, I'm going to qualify those down to five. I'm going to call all five of those and I'm going to get two customers out of it. Well, then I can predict my business. If I need 10 customers, 10 times two, two I, I just need 50 leads. Okay. And if I can build my business a court like that scientifically, I'm in good shape. But it's just when it's all up here in the nebulous and the unknown. Again, the, the idea here is if you can measure it, you can manage it. Manage it. So the, the idea of the work hard is if I want to measure leads, well, then I need to set a goal. How many leads do I need to see every week so that we can grow our business? Let's just say this one is we need to see 10 leads. So guess what I'm going to do? Every single week, I want to see this scorecard and I want to know how many leads. Let's say it was nine and then it was 12 and then it was 10 and then it was nine. And I can start to see a trend here and I can see if I'm on track or off track with that goal. Here's where the power comes because it's not just about the data or the measurable, it's about who is accountable to get that number on track. And so if we go back to our accountability chart, it's pretty clear this is Amy's job. So Amy every week tells me yes or no, did we, were we able to get 10 new leads? And if she did, great. And guess what, when, we have, when these numbers are green on our scorecard for six weeks, weeks in a row, guess what I'm doing to number 10 up here? We're going up, we're gonna to go to 11. If Amy is struggling to get to 10, she has to have a forum to raise her hand and say, hey, I don't know how to get this back on track. I'm not getting enough leads, I need help. And we as leaders, when we hear someone on our team say, I need help, we gotta pounce because our only job is to make sure Amy has the resources, tools, skills, and anything else that she needs to get 10 leads a week. Because if we believe that 10 leads is gonna to lead to two sales, Let's obsess about that. So again, if you can measure it, by all means, you can manage it. But it's getting really clear on what we're measuring, what the goal is, and importantly, who's accountable for it. And then the exercise is just to go build out. Pick five or eight things in your organization that you want to see on a week, week in and week out basis and start tracking them every single week. And some of them are going to be wrong and need changed. Other ones are going to be great. Some of them you're not sure how you're going to get to the data to but start building the habit of tracking the most important happening things in your organization so that the reports will, when it tells you what happened, it'll be what you want to have happened. Uh, last thing, and then I'm gonna move on from this. The second part of data is then measurables. And so I know this is gonna sound crazy. You ready for this? But what if, when we talk about, we talk to Amy about her role, and what she's accountable for. What if we also give her a lot of clarity on what scorecard measures we're gonna measure week in and week out for that, for her progress. So now she's clear on what she does, where it fits in the organization, what she's accountable to deliver, and those numbers, those things that we're gonna to use to measure success in the role. Like that clarity right there, there are Fortune 100 companies that can't give that to their people. It's not that hard. It just takes work. That's the idea of data, objectively saying yes or no, we're moving forward. When we're not moving forward, that creates issues. And again, issues are not bad. By the way, the rest of this will go a lot faster. Issues, again, are not bad things. They're just things that we have to deal with. There's two parts to this that we teach. The first one is the issues list. And the second one is something we call IDS. IDS. I'll start with the issues list first. The issues list is it's exactly what it sounds like. It's just a list of all of the stuff. If your scorecard is off track, if you've got employee issues, if you're not sh sure about one, it's just get it on the list. And I'm telling you, there is therapy in creating an organization where it's okay to say, hey, I have an issue. I need some help, right? What's so crazy for me, what's so crazy to me is that people are scared to put issues on the issues list because we think it's something that we're going to get fired if we're stuck. And I'm telling you this, if you're working in a healthy organization, no one's getting fired because they get stuck. You're going to get fired because you didn't ask for help and you were stuck for six weeks and then we got to go make a bigger change. So creating a culture where it's okay to ask for help is critical. You have to have that so that we can know how to resolve the issues in our business for the greater good of the organization to move forward. So it works just like this. 
I've got, uh, what do I have? I've got 10 issues up here. And as I'm going throughout the week, oh, you know what? That's something else. Here's number 11. And we're just adding issues to the issues list, just things we need to solve. Some of them are good. There might be a request for a proposal or a new customer thing. Some of them are bad, but they're just, just look at them as stuff. Remember, your greatness is not how few issues you have. It's how well you can work the list. That's great in, the, in this. And then the second part of that is once we have the issues list, then we go to work IDSing the issues. The I stands for identify. The D is to discuss. And the S is then to move to a solve. Identify the issue. What is the issue? What's the root cause? Oftentimes when you see the issue, what you're seeing is not actually the root cause. So ask why to, okay, why is this happening? Okay, why is that happening? We're getting there now, why is that happening? Okay, that's the root. Go solve that and then the symptom will resolve. Again, a hint here, most of the issues that you're facing are because of weakness in one of those six things. So use that as a filter. Gosh, this is just a process. We just don't have a good process for that. It's a person issue. Here we are again, talking about Dave. We're still having a people issue. Or we as a leadership, we just don't know the answer to that yet. But get it down to one of these six things and work to solve that. The symptoms will resolve when you solve for the root. Then the discuss, once you're clear on what you're solving, the discussion is just, okay, how do we help Morgan with her issue? And then we just go to work. Only thing we're talking about is how we help Morgan get this thing resolved. No politicking, no lobbying, no side agendas, just helping Morgan get what she needs solved so that we can then solve the issue, meaning move it on, and then we're on to the next one. And as we work through an issues list, we just check them off as we go, and, and that's what it looks like. Again, that's the stuff of culture, being able to say, hey, I have an issue, help me identify it at the root. I'd love to discuss it with my team. Let's get this thing solved because we got another issue coming up. Okay, then we go over to process, two parts to that. The first is to make sure that all of the processes in your organization are documented, which sounds crazy, but that means that you've actually spent the time to outline how to do the most important things in your organization the right in the best way every time. Most organizations haven't done that. Everyone knows they need to, most people don't. And then once it's done, once it's documented, FBA, it's gotta be followed by all. We have to make sure that everyone's actually doing it the right and the best way. The way that I, I always illustrate this or, or uh, demonstrate this is every organization has a handful of core processes, like truly core things that they do. I'm not talking about like we're not bots here, we didn't hire a bunch of robots. So, you know, we need people to think when they do their jobs, but this is the 20% of stuff that gets us 80% of the way there. And then let's just break it down. So you absolutely have some sort of HR process. Maybe this is how we find talent. This is how we hire that talent. Here's how we onboard and train that talent. Here's how, here's how we assess that talent quarterly, annually, whatever that looks like. Maybe there's a, a step in there about how we exit talent from the organization. There's clearly a marketing process, finding leads, closing leads, filling the pipeline, qualifying, whatever that looks like. Again, most of the stuff in here. There's sales. There's usually two or three operational processes, uh, depending on the organization. Uh, there's always a finance process. This is how we invoice. This is how we do month end reporting. This is how we do expense reports. Again, the 20% of the stuff that gets us 80% of the way there. Hopefully there's a customer service process. But what we've done is taken the whole organization here, really broken this down into really just eight core steps. Maybe it's five, maybe it's 10, but it's kind of five, six, seven, eight core processes. And then steps within that, we've broken the organization really into 40 or 50 things, right? And again, it's the 20%, the 50 things that get us 80% of the way there. And it lets us start to diagnose where our inefficiencies are. Man, we are crushing it here and here and here, but we keep running into this problem. I don't know what's going on, but it seems that we're linearly, we're breaking down right here, right here. We're, start, we're able to start to see our organization as a system and not just this place where we show up and the stuff that we do, but we can actually start to build efficiency. And by the way, guess what happens when we identify places that we're broken down, we just add it to the issues list. It just becomes something that we have to solve. 
We're gonna go in there, we're gonna tweak and fine tune that and then see if it works. And it won't work, it's gonna break, but it's gonna break somewhere else. And then when that becomes an issue, we're just gonna add that to the issues list, eternally solving issues for the greater good of the organization. And again, then make sure that we've got to measure compliance and make sure everyone's doing it the right and the best way every single time. All right, bring it home here, we get into the traction component. Again, this is where the rubber of the tire grips the road. This is where execution occurs in the organization. And there's two parts to that. The first is this idea of rocks. I talked about rocks up here already, but rocks are just the most important things we've got to get done every single 90 days. We're creating a 90 day world where we're not getting distracted with the three year. We're not getting distracted even with the one year. It's just how do we go have an awesome quarter this quarter? And if we've done good work planning, and we go execute on this quarter, and we can do that four times in a row, four great quarters, we're gonna have a great year. And we keep that same discipline for the next two years, we're at our three-year picture on our way to our 10-year target. So rocks are just the most important things, not letting all the distractions get in our way, just making sure that we're calling those out and making sure that those things are actually getting done every single quarter. And then the last one here in conclusion is the meeting pulse creating an effective meeting pulse in this organization, in your organization, so that all the circles stay connected and you're using that time well, so you can actually go work on the business and not just be meeting about the business. I'm gonna go all the way over here to, uh, can you see that Caleb? Can I get a thumbs up if you can see this right here? Okay, good. So there's really, this is what we call the L10 meeting. Again, this is in traction, uh, if you think that this is helpful, but it starts like this, we call it L10 because it's about, we, at the end of this, we're gonna rate it and we hopefully are getting a 10. And here's how it works. We start with good news. This is just the psychological, getting your team in, in the room and saying, okay, what's good in our organization? We're just setting the tone and we're re removing ourselves from down in the organization so we can elevate above and look down on it, working on the business, not down in the business. Five minutes and five minutes only, don't spend more than that. And then when the, you know, if you start your meeting at 10, at 10.05, you move into a scorecard review, and you're literally going to review your scorecard. So Amy, leads, how'd you do last week? I had nine leads, goal was 10. All right, is that an issue? Can you get that on track? Can you get it up to 10? No, I can't. All right, we're going to add it to our issues list. Or yes, I can get it. I was just on vacation last week. I can get more this week. Okay, great. You got it. You're accountable. We trust you. You're good. Then we start to review rocks. And again, this is just an on track, off track. So we go down here and look at the rocks that have been created for that quarter, read through them word for word and say, Caleb, are we on track or off track? And he's gonna say on track or off track. If it's off track, if the scorecard's off track, if the rocks are off track, we're going to drop it down to the IDS, the issue solving portion of our meeting. So rocks are, uh, off track, drop them down, scorecards off track, rock it down. And then the next one we're gonna review is any customer or employee headlines. This is where uh, someone ran in the half marathon and hey, Jamie did a great job. She placed third in her age division on, great job. Uh, somebody got married. Then we can also talk about customers. This person sent an email, they loved it. This is great. This is a good time for if you have bad customer reviews or hard customer conversations. This, these are headlines, not discussions, but bring those up as well. And if there are any issues that we need to talk about, drop it down. So you can see through this, through the, the meeting, we're just populating an issues list. The point of the front half of the meeting is to dredge up issues. The point of the back half is to solve those issues. Next, then we get into uh, number five here, which is the to-do list. And to-dos are all the stuff from last week that we said we were gonna do. And it's just accountability. So it's saying, all right, and, and that, by the way, the goal for to-dos is to get these solved in the next seven to 14 days. So to-dos are one to two week action items. And so I'll say, Morgan, how'd you do on number one? She said, got it. Caleb, number two, great. Alan, number three. Drew, how'd you do? Number four. Okay, anything else that's still up there? Is it an issue? Do we need to drop it down? If it became an issue, whoops, I gotta stay consistent with pillar here. If it is an issue, then by all means, drop it down to the issues list. The goal is every week to get 90% of the to-dos to done. 
that's moving it forward. So 90% of those to do's we're trying to get to done. That only lasts five minutes as well. So you can see we've got one, two, three, four, five components. We're 25 minutes into a 90 minute meeting and now we're ready to solve issues. And that issues list is exactly what we did right here. The way it works is we sit down and say, okay, what's the most important thing on this list? Number seven. All right, uh, what's second? Number two. And what's third? Number nine. All right, number six. No, we're sorry, number seven. That's the first issue. Alan, what's the issue? And Alan is going to walk us through, here's what's going on. Here's the help that I need. We're going to work as a team to identify, discuss, and solve the issue, move it forward. And when we've done that, we're going to take it off the list and we're going to go to number two. Same thing. And then we're going to go to number three. When we're done with the first three, we're going to reshuffle the deck, re-rank, and keep solving issues. We're going to do that for a full 60 minutes and clean up our issues list. If something's left over, that's okay because we worked on the most important stuff first. And then when there's five minutes to go in our 90 minute meeting, we then conclude the meeting. And importantly, we rate the meeting one through 10. One is this was a terrible meeting. This was a waste of time all the way to 10. I'm clear. I've got what I need. I know what success looks like for the next week. And here we go. One through 10, always working for a level 10 meeting. Okay, so you can see here how all this comes together. Hopefully you can start to see that driving vision, clarity on where you're going, how you plan to get there. Having the right people in your organization to help you achieve that vision. Using data to measure your progress. Solving issues at the core making sure that process is good to get the right and best outcomes every single time, and then watching the tires grip the road. That's the traction component of the business. Okay, that was number two, the tools. A couple of things here in terms of application, and then I'll leave about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, the first thing I would recommend, let me switch colors again here. Uh, the first thing I would recommend that you do is really give some thought to this. Take your accountability chart, your org chart, and try to make it something where you're clear on each seat of the organization and spell out the five things, those five main bullet points that your organization, you need that seat to accomplish. And obviously do that for all of the seats in the organization, or at least at the, the main level. And then this is a really healthy discussion. If sales has four or five seats underneath it, this is a really great discussion to have with the person leading your sales team and have them do this exercise. Again, we're trying to institutionalize this. Name the role. Number two is assign the bullet points, what that seat's accountable for, and then put the person in the seat if they get it, want to have the capacity to do it. That's a really healthy exercise. The second thing I would suggest is over here on the scorecard, let me put stars by it, work on the people, and then get a scorecard. Get in the habit of tracking things weekly. What measurables do you want to know week in and week out on your business? Set a goal for each week and then figure out who's accountable for that and just start measuring it. Again, it's not about perfect. It's about building the habit right now. There'll be a point where you get to a scorecard that you love. Set rocks. You will build your organization on a foundation of rocks. Set really good rocks. What is the most important thing we can get done between now and you know the end of the quarter? And if right now you probably say between October 1st and December 31st, what do we have to get done three to seven most important things. The rest of this will sort of work out along, uh, along the way, but give some real thought to the scorecard, the rocks, and accountability in the organization. And if you have any questions on that, I'm certainly uh, available to help. Uh, I do want to have two more uh, resources for a couple more things for resources, and then I'll, uh, I'll go to question and answer. So the first thing I talked about was the book Traction. Uh, again, if you're live here, I'm happy to send you a copy of that. And then there's another book, if you like more of the allegory style, so less content and more of just a story, it's called Get a Grip. And this is what it looks like to go through a, a full uh, EOS implementation. The implementer in here, his name is Alan, and Alan is what I do. So if, if you read that, think Dusty uh, in, in that respect. And then, you know, the last thing I'll tell you is uh, there's a couple ways you can do this. The first one is by all means, get the books, read it, and just start implementing it. There's plenty of tools online uh, and, and you can get all my information online. Uh, if your organization is a little larger in scale and you think that this is something that would be helpful to have someone uh, do, you can certainly reach out to me and I can connect you to an implementer, whether it's me or there's a number of people 
in our network. Uh, the idea is you need to make sure that EOS is right for you and the implementer is right for you. Those are the two things that you'll want to make sure. So you can do everything from just reading the book to hiring someone full time to come, or not full time, but hiring someone to come in and do a, a full implementation uh, with your organization. Okay, I'm done talking here. Let's see, I'm one minute over here, but we, we have about nine minutes uh, for any Q and A. So uh, I'll, Caleb, I'll turn it over to you to field. I'm gonna close the door really quick because my dog is trying to walk in here. Yeah, absolutely. So if you have a question for uh, Dusty, feel free to unmute yourself and ask him directly. If you uh, don't feel comfortable asking out loud, you can drop it in the chat box and we'll, and we'll take it from there. So hey, Caleb, this is Alan. Listen, I, I don't know if you can hear me. I just want to tell you, I got to hop off. I got a one o'clock. This is my first uh, startup webinar. This is solid. So thanks for awesome. all your help getting me. I really, yeah, really absolutely. Appreciate thank, thank you yeah. for joining us, Alan. I'll see you on the trail sometime, Alan. Thank you, Dusty, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah. I'll see you on the trail. Yeah. Too. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, Dusty, you're batting a, a thousand. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I was just going to say this is super helpful and also super timely. Um, I've uh, known Dusty for 15 years and haven't yeah, seen Yeah, so randomly, but here we go. Yeah. So it's really crazy because uh, Tiffany Henry, the conductor, sent me a link. Um, we just did strategic planning with the conductor this week, and she sent me a link to this webinar. And I'm like, Dusty Pruitt, I know that guy. And so I'm actually reading traction right now already. Yes. So Dusty, I'll be in touch because I think we'll definitely want to engage you to help us implement it. That's great. So Drew and I work together for the Hugh O'Brien Youth Program in Arkansas, yep. probably 15 years ago, maybe longer than that. It has definitely been 15 years. It's yeah. been a while. I feel a lot older yep. than I did then. <laughs> Any other questions? Dusty, I'm wondering, um, I'm curious if you've ever seen it uh, really work to do from an intern, like internally. Um, I, I'm curious about that just because I feel like a lot of times, um, organizations or businesses are just maybe stuck in their ways or kind yeah. of, I don't, I don't want to say fractured, but spread thin often. And, and I, I'm just curious to see if it, if it, if, yeah, if it ever works if for works. someone, even in a leadership position to be like, yeah, I'm going to get the book and read it and do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does. It does work. Really? Um, it takes the right person to be able to do that. Well, though, it's got to be the, a person that can, back up from the organization and objectively look down on it. And then, you know, so much of the value, this is the reason I hired a, a facilitator or an implementer in my, in my businesses was because I couldn't participate and also facilitate the discussion at the same time. So it was yeah. more valuable to me to have somebody lead my team through it than it was to try to do both at once. But absolutely, we hear success stories all the time. Uh, typically, the smaller the organization, the more it works, because uh, you know, if it's a six or seven person operation, the bigger, it just makes sense to, to bring someone in. So, but yes, it does work. Uh, but, um, you know, obviously all of the clients I do this with have, have brought me in. You know, the, the idea is to, for my, I call my business teaching traction because my job is to teach it. And then at some point you don't need me anymore. And, and that's the goal for me is to get it out of my head and into your head and apply it. And then I get out of the way not like institutionalize myself in the organization because that's not helpful and that's not teaching. So that's how, how we think of ourselves as implementers. That's awesome. Anything else? All right, here's how I finish. If Caleb, if on, on my parting shot here, this is how I finish every single session I do with clients. This is how I'll finish it with you. But you will build your organization walking out of here today the most important thing you can do, the things that you will build your organization on are right here. Get your rocks done. Do not get distracted. If those truly are the most important things that you have to get done to have a great year, get them done. Because if you have a great quarter and you do four of those in a row, you're gonna have a great year. You do that three times in a row, you're gonna have that three year picture in your pocket. And if you do that three more times, you're building the organization you want. You will build your organization on a foundation of rocks. Don't get distracted. Stay focused. And Caleb, thanks so much for, for the time today. Thank you, Dusty. And for all those watching, um, I will send you an email with a link to the video if you want to share it with colleagues, um, share it with people in your office, share it with whoever you want to. Um, that way you can have that. Um, I also had some folks reach out in the chat privately so they're interested in the book. Um, 
and we'll connect over, over a, a follow-up email. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dusty. We're going to make this like a weekly thing. How about that? <laughs> Done. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Everybody have a great day. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.